who causes the problem. So this is the person or character who the protagonist might have to face off against. So you have a situation where you have the hero or the underdog and you have the villain. So your antagonist is your villain. Of course, you may have secondary characters in your story as well. Keep in mind, however, for the exam, your story has a word limit of approximately 450 words. So you cannot have too many secondary characters because you will not get to develop that many people, that many characters in one short story. So your secondary characters, limit them to say about two, possibly three, no more than that. Now, each of those characters will fall into one of these categories. So you have your dynamic or round characters. Now, as the name suggests, something that is dynamic has many different layers. It has a lot going on. So your dynamic character is a character who is going to be multifaceted. So you don't have this character being one way at the beginning and it's sustained right to the end you have a character who is going to show different sides of their personality. So they might be angry one minute, they'll be upset another minute, they'll be happy another minute. Different things will be responded to in different ways, but you don't have them on one level. They're not two-dimensional, they're three-dimensional. Now on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have your static characters. These characters, unlike the dynamic, do not change. They are the same way from start to finish. There is nothing that happens that shows different sides of them. So the danger is that you do not want to have too many static characters. Static characters do serve a purpose that we'll discuss later on, but you do not want to have too many of them. And if you do have a static character, then you need to use this static character in your story to somehow bring out the dynamism in your dynamic character so they can act as a foil to your dynamic character in a sense. So make sure that you try as much as possible to have dynamic characters, but if you do have a static character, ensure that that person, that character is being utilized. They're not just there to fill up space. So knowing what types of characters you have, now you need to consider what makes a character a good character. So your character needs to be credible. Your character needs to be easily visualized. So anyone who reads your story should be able to see this character in their mind's eye. And credibility is important because you want somebody who is believable. So I shouldn't read your story and say, then how oh, is a person is so perfect? Not a flaw them not have, that sort of thing. No, your character should be a character that somebody can think of who relates to them. So I should read your story or anyone should read your story and be able to say, I know somebody like this or I know somebody like that. So they should have the traits that someone can identify with. So now we have to look at characterization and what it does. So characterization, the methods by which your writer will put to use in order to develop the main character and supporting characters within a story. In short, how you present your characters, the different things you're going to do to bring out certain elements, bring out certain character traits and that sort of thing. You are the master of this piece of writing. So nothing can go in it unless you put it there. So whatever you put there will aid in characterization. So however you build your character, that's what the reader will see because that is what you have presented to us. So you have direct characterization. And as you, as you can see here, this is where the writer tells the reader about the character's personality. And they do this using the narrator sometimes, sometimes using another character, sometimes using the main character and revealing aspects about himself or herself. So 
you are going to directly put in the details about the character somehow. So in narrating the story, John Brown is an angry boy. Through another character, the character can say, John Brown, you're an angry boy. John Brown himself can think to himself that he's angry. Or he can be putting a situation where you see the traits coming out. Then the more subtle way to do it is to have indirect characterization. Now, as you see here, as opposed to the writer telling us about the character, the writer is revealing things about the character. So you reveal this by showing the personality through thoughts and feeling and actions. So you do not openly state anything. You just have the character behave in a manner that brings out the different traits. So if John Brown is sitting down and stamping his foot, if he is behaving in a particular way, you say what he's doing, then we can figure out that he's either sad or angry or tired. If he goes to lie down, if he sighs, we know that he's possibly sad. You haven't told us he is sad, but you have given us little behaviors that we can use to track and figure out that he's a sad boy, he's a hungry boy, he's a tired boy, any of those things. So here are the various ways you can go about getting to indirect characterization. So you can describe the appearance of the character. So if you have a character who is always well-dressed, then there are certain things that are being revealed about that character because they always dress well, they always put themselves together well. So we know that this person is probably meticulous, perhaps. Perhaps they are fashion conscious. If you have a character who is always late, who is always eating, there are things that you're telling us about them that you haven't stated outright. So you're giving us hints. It's like a mystery for us to solve. And most people like to solve a mystery. So if you're going to describe the character's actions or their behaviors or their reactions, then that is a way of you showing different things about them too. So you put your character in a situation. For instance, two boys are walking and they both see a pile of money on the ground. One boy is going to try and grab that money while the other boy is going to try and hold him back. Now, we haven't said anything yet, you know, but in the whole scenario of one boy reaching for the money, we know something about him. And in the same scenario with the other boy holding him back, we know something about this one as well. So there are things in how they react that tell us about them. So you can put your characters in different situations and the way they behave in response to the situation will reveal things about them without you having to say it outright. Again, little hints. You want a mystery to solve. So you can also reveal what the character is thinking. Now remember I said before, you are the master of this creation. So whatever we learn is what you tell us. So you can reveal the character's thoughts. You can go into their stream of consciousness. So John Brown can be sitting and he is worried. And you don't have to say he's worried. You reveal what he's thinking about. And through what he's thinking about, us, the reader, can determine that, why John Brown really afraid for true. So John Brown is there and saying, what am I going to do? The test is in the morning. I haven't been to any classes. I haven't read anything. How am I going to pass? So we learn right there, he's worried about the test. And we also learn, John is not the best student in the world because he has sat there and done no work. And now he has a test looming and he's worried about it. So you don't have to be explicit in telling us about the character. You can just give us these little tidbits to sup on and build your character. Dialogue is very useful in characterization for many, many reasons. Now, the way your character speaks can reveal things about the character. Your character says, yo dog, as opposed to, hello sir says something about them. Your character speaks fluent English, 
as opposed to fluent Creole says something about them. Your character speaks one way to someone, very polite, very stiff, very official. And in another scenario, your character is very casual, very loose. You are revealing things about the character. So you can use dialogue to help you. Now, please be mindful. It is good to have dialogue in your story, but please don't just put it there and it serves no purpose. Use it for this purpose. Use it to reveal things about your character. Now, you can also use the dialogue of other characters to reveal something about your character as well. So two characters talking about John Brown can tell us the reader about John Brown as well. Two characters in the way they talk to John Brown can tell us about their relationship with him. So if these characters seem very fearful in their speech, um, sir, um, well, you see, we wanted to go. Uh, that tells us that hmm, John Brown has a little hold over them. Maybe John Brown is a shutter. We don't sure. Something about John Brown makes them afraid of him because of how they speak to him. In another sense, John Brown, come here. That tells us that John Brown is a subordinate to this person. So the way you use the dialogue can enrich the writing and it can enrich your character development. So make sure whatever dialogue you use, you use it and you use it well. Now we kind of touched on this a while ago. When you describe the reaction of other characters, there are different ways to do that. So when John Brown walks into a room, do the others hold their heads down? Do they peep out and look at him? That reveals that there is some amount of power or authority that John Brown has. When John Brown walks into a room and nobody pays him any attention, that tells you that Cha, John Brown has ups. Nobody don't really even care about him. John Brown walks into a room and he's immediately surrounded by females. <laughs> John Brown are gallus. So the way other characters respond to your character can tell us about the character. So of course, character development. What is it? So here we have it. It's a process of building a unique, remember that word, unique, three-dimensional character with depth, personality, and clear motivations. So what you are striving to do is ensure that your character stands out. You don't want to write a character that is in every single story, every single movie. This character is just, there's nothing special about them. So you want something about your character to stand out, to make them special because it's your creation, you know, you are special. So make your character special too. You want to make them three-dimensional. So as we said before, you want this person to have different layers. There must be something that keeps your reader interested in this character. So your character has to be written in such a way that we find out new things about them as we progress through your story. So we don't just know that in the beginning, your character is this way, and then there's no new information to make it seem as if there's anything going on. Can't be the same way all day, every day. None of us is the same way all day, every day. We change as we go through different situations. We change as we face different circumstances. Make sure your character has depth. So you want to show that this character feels this character has emotions. So this character can show sadness. You want a range, you know. Because again, think of when you are reading. And many of you don't like to read, you know. And I always find it so strange that the people who clamor the most that reading is boring, when given the chance to create a masterpiece, what do they do? Nothing. So you have this opportunity now to show every book you've ever read, every author you've ever heard of that, listen, I can do this too. So you want your character to have a range of emotions, to have a range of feeling. Give us something to identify with. Give us something to look at. Give us something to question even. Why this boy behaving like this? You don't have to tell us everything one time, you know. So give us something to hold us from start to finish. And of course, you want the clear motivations. 
So your character should behave in a way that is understandable. So it shouldn't be that big a mystery. Yes, I said you want to give us a mystery, but it shouldn't be such a mystery that there's no link to anything at all. So if your character is going to steal something, then we need to somehow, up to that point, understand why they're going to steal it. We don't have to agree with them stealing it. But we need to have that idea of why is it that he's going to steal this? What is it about this thing that is valuable to him? Is it that he is poor? Is it that it belongs to his family and it was stolen from him and he's now stealing it back? So we need to have those ideas in our minds when we're looking at the motivation behind certain things. And this goes for both your protagonist and your antagonist too. Because even though the antagonist is the villain, we need a villain that we can still say, hmm, all right, you're bad, but we see why. Now, in this, it is a process. So keep that word in mind. It is a process. So you're not going to put everything about your character in one place. So you're not going to just write one paragraph and have everything revealed. It's a process. So you're going to go through your story and you're going to develop. You're going to build on it. So you're going to go through and tell us the changes the character is undergoing. You're going to tell us what is going to happen. So how are they acting or reacting? as the situations develop. Now, this is something that you need to focus on. The idea that a few well-chosen words can introduce a character. And then you can further develop the character through his words and actions. A problem that many students face when writing their stories. You spend a paragraph or two, and then you just describe the character in totality. So you tell us, everything about the character. He's tall, he has curly dark hair, brown eyes, red lips or pink as the case may be. He has wide shoulders, he has long legs, he has strong arms, he has this and he has that. And You don't need to do it all in one place. You can simply start your introduction. Let us know that the character exists. So John Brown walked into the room. At that point, you don't need to tell us anything more about John Brown directly. You can start to tell us about John Brown indirectly. So remember the scenario I gave you. John Brown walked into the room. How the other people in the room react to John Brown will tell us something about John Brown. What John Brown does when he walks into the room can tell us about John Brown. If he walks into the room, goes directly to his seat, puts his head on the desk, what is that telling us about him? For one, he seems as if he has things on his mind. He doesn't want to be bothered by anyone, perhaps. Two, maybe he doesn't like the people who are around him. That's a, that's a possibility. We don't always like everybody around us. So he goes straight to his desk, puts his head down, and that's it. He doesn't talk to anyone. If he goes into the room, he looks around, he smiles. That is telling us something about him. Because he's looking around, so he's either looking for somebody and then he smiles when he sees them, or he's just that type of person. Just looks in, likes what he sees and say, yeah, I like this room. I'm staying in this room here. So what your characters do can tell us more than you just listing out everything about them. Even in describing your character, you can show us how they look rather than tell us how they look. So if when John walks into the room, he has to duck his head to get in, you don't have to tell us he's tall. We can figure that out. He's tall. If John Brown has to climb on a chair to reach something, then we know that he's a little vertically challenged. If John Brown cannot pass between two desks, then we know he's a little on the side. So you don't have to tell us he's tall, he's short, he's slim, he's fat, he's brown, he's black. You can bring out that description in how you tell what he's doing. So now, you're going to justify the character's reason for existence by establishing their story goal and their motivation. 
why you have this character in your story. So what is the goal that they have? What is the motivation behind it? So motivation now. Motivation is where you're going to say in order to give them some meaning. You're going to think of why is it that John Brown has to do this or has to do that? What would make him feel happy? What would make him feel satisfied? You have to think about your characters before you write your story because you need to know who they are and what they're about. So in thinking about the story you're going to write, you have John Brown. What am I going to say about John Brown? What type of person is John Brown? Is John Brown going to be seeking permission to do something? Is he going to order people to do something? What are the motivations behind his actions? And then what is the goal? Why is he in the story? So what is his ultimate goal? Because what happens is if you don't think it through, then you might end up writing and then you end up stuck at a point and you can't go left, you can't go right and nobody can rescue you because it's your story really and you're in the exam scratching your head, staring at the back of the head of the person in front of you, staring at the floor, staring at the ceiling. You don't know where else to go. So you have to think it through in your mind before you get into it. Think about your character. Who is this person? What is their ultimate goal? And what is the motivation that they have towards receiving this goal? So John Brown needs to pick up some things. Why? Let's make sure you do that. So let's continue. So now we're at the point where you will give the character an external and an internal conflict. We're going to look at conflicts in more details in another lesson. But for now, just think of it. The character has to have a problem that they're facing. But even while they're facing that outward problem, they can also be conflicted on the inside. So while your character is trying to climb a mountain within himself, he has these doubts. He has confidence, perhaps, that he will be able to. And at some point in the story, he starts to doubt himself. Maybe things are going wrong. He can't find his rope. Maybe people are abandoning the whole expedition. So have an external conflict and also include some elements of an internal conflict. So now, what will this problem be? So you have to think about it. John is going to try and win a race. So, of course, the external conflict is him and the other competi competitors. All of them are there. They want to win the race as well. What is going to be his internal conflict now? Is it that he's going to think, well, he sees his major competition from last year in this race too, so his confidence starts to shake and quaver? Is it that he's going to see where he's not as well prepared as the other athletes? What will be the situation? Then how will the external and internal conflicts tie into each other? So they can't be two separate issues. They have to connect in some way. And of course, will this conflict affect them in other ways? So talk about, think about all of those and then write them out in your story as well. So make sure that your character has both strengths and weaknesses. And this is very important. Your character cannot only be the hero. It can't be that they are good at everything. They need to have some strengths as well as some weaknesses. And you need to bring out each of them equally. So notice, your character who has both flaws and strengths is going to be more believable. They're going to maintain the tension because if you have a character with no flaws at all, then right then and there, your story is in danger of becoming one dimensional because we already know this person is going to overcome in the end. Why bother read the story? Because you have built up such a perfect person, there won't be any problem they can't face and overcome. So we don't need to read the story if you know if they overcome. They're going to overcome. Right then and there, I have no reason to continue reading it. So them having these issues, these flaws and these strengths will keep us reading because we're going to say, all right, yes, we know he's going to overcome, 
but how and to what extent is he going to be able to be victorious and everybody cheering for him or is he just going to have a quiet win and take it in stride so we need to know how this is going to play out now your character strengths of course will cause us to support them so the strengths are going to be the reason we support them but we need the weaknesses as well for us to identify with them for us to believe in them so these weaknesses make them relatable everybody has weaknesses some more obvious than others so your character needs to have weaknesses as well remember you know, nobody is perfect nobody is perfect so neither should your character be perfect because in creating this perfect character you have made them unrelatable to anybody who reads it so make sure that they have flaws that are equally consequential meaning you're not going to give them some superficial flaws. So John is really good at communication. And what is his flaw? He likes to bite his nails. That is not going to really interest us because that doesn't say much. So John is really good at communication, but his flaw is that he tends to be too friendly with people and because of that people take advantage of him now you're building up something about john that is interesting to us because you have taken a good thing and you have shown us the bad side to it so john is very friendly he likes to talk to people but the danger he always faces is that he trusts people too much and because he trusts people too much, they take advantage of him. They do things that hurt him and possibly those around him. So those flaws are equally important as his strengths. Now make sure that the flaws and the strengths balance out. So you don't want the flaws to overwhelm the strengths because in that case, then you have set up a situation where your character can never win. However, you don't want the flaws to be too low as we said before so you want to try and equate them let them equalize each other so that we can see now and we can pay attention to how is it that your character is going to overcome the difficulties he or she has to face you don't need to counter every positive one or characteristic with a negative one there is no need so you don't have to say he's good at this but bad at that good at this but bad at that you can just have the one major flaw that will take care of everything again once the flaw is consequential there are things that can happen because of this flaw that is what is important now you need to decide if your character is going to be static or dynamic we talked about this earlier so again your static character stays on one level. They don't really change. Everything is the same. Your dynamic character grows and changes. We see different sides of them coming out. They improve over the course of the story. But again, as we said before, the static characters do serve a purpose. So here are some things. Is it that your character may not change because that is just who they are so your character is just a coward coward from the beginning coward right throughout coward at the end if that is the case then you need to make that be important that they don't change because there's an important reason behind it you think of some stories or even movies you have watched you have one character who grows and changes but then there's another character who remains the same now that character who remains the same ends up highlighting something about the one who grows and changes. So if your character doesn't change at all, then they should serve a purpose in helping another character to change. So you have John Brown, who in the beginning, he has conflicts. John has a friend who is very mean. The friend is mean right throughout. So nothing that anyone wants help with, this friend is unwilling to do it. It is through this friend that we see John Brown's character coming out because John Brown might be the one who has to end up helping people because his friend refuses to. John might have to be the one who tries to encourage his friend to change, even though he might just stick to his guns and say, oh, I'm going to do it. But 
through this friend, we see other things coming out. So the character, again, may not change in order to affect the change in the world around them. So perhaps John is a very religious boy. He's very kind-hearted. He subscribes to any particular religion. And you need him to be faithful to whatever doctrines he has because he wants to influence others to believe in this doctrine. So you can't have him giving up his faith because the whole idea is that you want others to come to understand and to accept what he believes in. So for that case, he can't change. He has to remain true to himself. So in that situation, him being static in that regard serves a purpose. Remember, you know, if you have a static character, they need to serve a purpose. Now, of course, you have characters who will make a substantial change. Right there, you have your dynamic character. So your character makes a complete 180 degree or perhaps a 90 degree, but they make a change that is noticeable. They make a change that is impactful. So right there, you need to set up the situation where the change may not be sudden. It can be gradual, but you can see the change and see how the change came about. And then again, Reinforcement can come through static secondary characters. So your main character may not be the one who is static. You can use a secondary character who is static to help to show up the others in the story. Now, it is always good to give your character a backstory. However, do not spend so much time on the backstory that the present story gets lost. Keep that in mind. So yes, you want to give a backstory at times, but keep in mind, you have a time limit and you have a word limit to work with. And even though you're not penalized for going over the word limit, you end up penalizing yourself for going over the word limit. So your character's history, how important is it? So we want to see that if you include a backstory, whatever story you include, should somehow help us to understand who this character is. So don't just tell us he went to basic school and then high school and none of that has any bearing on the present situation in your story. Let your words count. So anything you tell us about the character's backstory must impact on who they are in front of us. Now, you want to develop the past if it is necessary and if it is relevant. So if it is not relevant to talk about their past, leave it out of your story. You don't want, yes, some of you might say, well, you know, I want to reach the word limit. Maybe you're struggling. There are better ways to go about doing it. So do not include anything that is irrelevant because you're not going to end up gaining marks. You might very well end up losing marks because your story now has taken on a very one dimensional tone. You're just giving us all this history, history, backstory, backstory. To what end? It serves no purpose in the present of your story. Now you want to ensure that you develop the characteristics and make them distinguishable. Now again, please note, you want to describe what is necessary about your character. So you do not need, as I said before, to tell us every single physical trait they have. You don't need to do that. However, you can, through either direct or indirect characterization, tell us the physical traits they have that are relevant, that are important. So if you have a character who is teased a lot for being a certain way, then that is a trait you need to tell us about. But if you're only going to tell us that Sylvia has long black hair and the long black hair has nothing to do with anything going on in the story. Then you could have left that out. So make sure that you can include some physical traits that can show how others react to them. So back to John Brown. John Brown is tall. John Brown is muscular. So right then and there, you're setting up a situation that when anybody sees John Brown coming, there's supposed to be a certain reaction that they have. Maybe the girls look at him and smile. <laughs> hey, John. Maybe the boys look upon him. Him again. 
but there should be something about the physicality that evokes a reaction. If John Brown is very small, he's diminutive, he's tiny, again, a certain reaction. Chances are, if he's very small, then the bigger boys will pick on him. So right then and there, you need to let us know that he's small. You don't have to tell us he's small, but you can tell us something about him that lets us understand that he's small. So when you're conceptualizing the character, when you're thinking about them in your mind, you think of their appearance. What are they going to look like? But more importantly, is what they look like going to have an impact on the story? If their physical attributes do not have any bearing on the story, then you don't need to include it. So if the fact that John is very tall or very short is not going to affect the price of rice, then leave it out. But if the fact that he is very tall is going to be important because he's going to end up helping someone and that changes the course of the story, then of course, include that. If the fact that he's very small means that he's teased, but in the end, it's his smallness that ends up making him a hero, then you need to include that as well. Now his voice or her voice, I keep saying his, but her voice, what do they sound like? Again, is the voice going to have any bearing on the story? So think about a case where you have this big, tall, strapping man with a little squeaky voice. Right then and there, you're setting up something. Or you can have a small person with a very commanding voice that sets up another situation as well. Do they have an accent? The accent will come into play because they're going to sound different from everyone else. And if they sound different from everyone else, they might be treated differently from everyone else. And does their voice appear to match the appearance? So try not to be too, too, too stereotypical with that. Try and be creative. So you can have someone with a voice that doesn't quite match with the picture you're seeing in front of you. So again, you can have big, tall, strapping John Brown and a little tiny voice. So let's continue. So make the character stand out with distinctive mannerisms. And when you're thinking of mannerisms, you're thinking of certain behaviors that they have that will stand out in your story. So you think of communication style. How do they interact with other people? So is it that this character is going to relate well to those around him? They tell everybody good morning. They talk nicely to everyone. Is it that they're very cold, very reserved? Their communication style will come into play because how is that going to affect their relationships? You have John Brown who when he's at home, he's locked away in his room. He doesn't talk to anybody in the house. That tells us something about him and how he relates to his parents, his siblings, anyone who comes into the house. Maybe when a visitor comes, he just looks at them and walks away. That tells us something about he, how he relates to people. Think about gait. Now, gait means the way a person walks, their movement. Now, think about this now. How do they make their way around their environment? So, is this person going to walk confidently? Is this person going to walk with a slouch? Is this person going to walk and look down at the ground all the time? Those things tell us about the character because if someone has a confident walk, if you have a character who is like a top shutter in the school, then of course he can't be walking and he has to walk like a big bad man. So he must exude that in his gait. Now, how is that now going to impact how they are treated? Because John Brown walks like is him on the school, then of course everybody is going to respond in like manner because he has this confidence in how he walks. So everybody is going to treat him as if he's the top man. Then think about a situation now. Say for instance, a female, when she walks, are the other men unconsciously, you know, looking and watching and saying, mm, yes, girl. Is that the kind of situation that you have? So the way your characters walk 
will tell you quite a bit about them. And then you have the other scenario now. When your character is around others, does the way they walk cause people to back away from them? So they have a threatening type of walk. They have a militant type of walk. So when this boy or this girl step in, everybody scatter away because they look as if they're out to fight right now. So those are some things you can think of in just describing the way your character walks. And then ticks, little actions that they do, little quirks that they have. So what do your characters do when they're nervous? Nervous. Some people when they're nervous, they start playing with their fingers, playing with things in their hand. Some people put their hands in the pocket. Some sway from side to side like a certain teacher. And some will do other things when they're nervous. When they're angry, what happens? You have different responses. Some people, when they're angry, their voice gets very loud. They explode. Others, when they're angry, they get very quiet, very deliberate, very silent, very icy. Then if they're uncertain of what to do, what do they do? Are they going to look around? Are they going to stare at the sky? That sort of thing. And if they're about to collapse from exhaustion, are they going to be melodramatic about it? Or are they just going to drop right there? We're looking now at developing an antagonist. So remember your antagonist is the person who will create problems. So they are important too. So you need to give the antagonist morality, meaning them can't just fully bad. There must be something about them that makes them believable, that makes them human. So we should know why it is this antagonist is the way he or she is. Why is it that they love to cause problems? Why is it that they are causing problems? Give us a reason so we can understand their side of the story. Even if we don't agree, but we still need to understand it. So they need to have their own morality, however warped. So perhaps your antagonist, in a grand scale, you have a story where this person is trying to enslave humanity. Sound familiar? So this person is trying to enslave humanity in order to save humanity. Now, in his or her mind, it makes sense because people are doing all kinds of things, war, crime, poverty, everything that is bad. So this person believes it is their moral right and responsibility to enslave everybody in order to keep them safe. Now, you want to give them believable reasons as well. So you want to ensure that your villain is not just crazy, full stop, but crazy, but with understanding. We understand why they think the way they think. So the reason must be believable. Something perhaps happened to them when they were younger and now they're reacting to it. So we want to understand what they're doing even if we still don't quite agree with what they're doing. Now, what is this desperate need or twisted belief that they have? You need to give us those details. So we can say, you're mad, but we understand why you're mad. You're bad, but we understand why you're bad. So these should come through their personal history. So here you can use their backstory to build on that. Now, of course, the antagonist has to be powerful. What is the point of having an antagonist with no power at all? What can they do? So if your antagonist is going to create problems, then they must be in a position to be able to create problems. They must have that authority, that power to create problems. So we want to see the main character overcome, but it shouldn't be a case where you set up well, I don't want to say David and Goliath because that did work out well in David's favor. But we don't want to have a situation where your, your protagonist is the Goliath and the antagonist is the David. We want a situation where your protagonist really has to work, has to really push in order to overcome whatever problem the antagonist is causing him or her. So... Your villain shouldn't be just a match. 
have your villain have a little edge over the hero. So the villain should be somebody that the hero really and truly has to dig deep to overcome. Because now they will have to collect different skills or learn different skills, collect different items, probably get some friends involved, that sort of thing. So it shouldn't be a case where him alone can do it all by him alone himself with no extra help as he is. So there must be something he has to do in order to overcome this situation that he is facing. Now we need to look at the use of dialogue. So just as how you're not going to just include descriptions for the sake of description, you're not going to include dialogue just for the sake of saying you have dialogue in there. So here are some functions of dialogue. The first and most obvious thing, it adds a sense of realism. Having people talking in the story helps to make the story more real because we're actually not just hearing about the characters, we are hearing from the characters as well. And of course, the dialogue is going to contribute to characterization. The way a character talks is going to be important. Who they talk to is going to be important. How they to talk to each other is going to be important. So keep that in mind. So the way the characters talk, who they talk to, who they don't talk to, and what they talk about, all important elements. Now you can use the dialogue to introduce the conflict or to develop the conflict. So instead of you, the narrator, narrating the conflict, you can have your characters talk about the problem that is coming up. Yo dog, you know, say, the boy they over this every single time, me tell the teacher, say, I want to present something. Him just run up and I tell her all kind of things. Have them talk it out so we can learn about it from a different voice, so to speak. Now, it will advance the plot as well. So your characters can talk about what it is they're going to do instead of us just waiting for it to happen. So we can know that this character plans to sabotage the other one. So we know that hmm, something coming up juicy down in the line. And then, of course, it can enhance the mood or tone. So those of you who do literature would be more familiar with this aspect of it. But the characters in talking to each other can create a mood, can create a tone, because what they choose to talk about and how they talk about it will enhance that aspect of the writing. Now, here are some things you need to note when you are using dialogue and you need to be careful. So each time the character changes, so the speaker is going to change from one speaker to the other. You need to start a new line and in fact, you indent it just like a new paragraph. So even if they're just saying one word, yes, start a new paragraph and then the response, another paragraph and so on and so forth. You do not have two speakers in the same line. It does not work that way. Now, the language must be suited to your speaker. So if your speaker is a teenager, then your speaker should sound like a teenager. Your, teacher shouldn't, your speaker shouldn't sound like a 40-year-old person or a 70-year-old person, unless, of course, you're going to tell us how it is that maybe they were raised by someone very mature, and that is why they sound mature. But a typical teenager must sound like a typical teenager. Then avoid dialogue that is just there for the purpose of being there. It does nothing. It doesn't advance the plot. It doesn't reveal anything to us about the characters. It just dead. How are you this morning? Fine, thank you. Okay, bye. Nothing. So keep the speech short and you need to make it seem natural. So think about when you are talking. Think about when you hear different conversations. The dialogue you write should reflect that. It should sound natural. So if you're writing in a Jamaican context, then please use some slang that we would use. Use some items of vocabulary that we would use. So you want it to sound authentic, but do not have any lengthy dialogue. Try and avoid the lengthy dialogue. And use contractions. People use contractions when they talk, so you can use contractions in the dialogue. In the dialogue, not in the story body. And then, of course, you're going to use vibrant and interesting tags. So a little catchphrases, little something to just spice it up a bit. And that will tell us more about the mindset of your character.
Now, of course, you need to get homework. What do you think? You get where? No, you did not. So here is what you need to do. So you're going to outline the characteristics of the protagonist you would have in this story prompt. So this is a prompt. To this day, people passing through Coconut Grove still top, stop and ask for waspy. So what you need to do now, based on this, who you think the protagonist would be, waspy or someone else? Maybe Waspy was a bad man and somebody run him out. So that is the person you're going to focus on, the person who caused Waspy to not be around anymore. Or perhaps you want to focus on Waspy himself. So you're going to think about all the things we have talked about today. So you're going to think about what will your protagonist look like? How are the ways you're going to show instead of tell us about the protagonist? How are you going to put it all together and create a rich piece of description, a rich development of whoever you choose to be the protagonist in this particular prompt? All right?